How's everybody doing? It's great to see you. It's great to see you. My uh, son is our middle child. He's almost five. He'll be five in a couple of months. And uh, he, we went, he's gone through, you know, a few phases in his life, but the longest phase, and once again, when you're four and a half, how long can phases actually last? But uh, he had a phase that went for probably half his life, uh, and that is his obsession with the movie Cars. Uh, and if you've never seen it, you should watch it. That'll be your homework for later. Um, <clears throat> but he just, he had his third birthday and his fourth birthday party were all Cars themed. Like we just kept the stuff from the year before. And he's like, what do you want? Cars. Like, yes. Pocket that extra cash. Um, but that was just the tip of the iceberg, which is just like, oh, I want a Cars birthday party. He went through a phase where he would only wear Cars clothes, uh, like Cars shirts. He had um, these two pairs of shorts that came, it was like a Cars outfit. And so it had like the shorts had like little patches and stuff and, uh, that were Cars related. So he would only wear the Cars shorts to the point where it's like every day, like his mom's forcing him, we have to wash them. You can't look homeless, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, and then he wasn't allowed to wear, this was the big fight on Sundays, he wasn't allowed to wear Cars gear uh, to church. And he's like, but I want everybody to know I love Cars. Like, don't worry about it. That's all you talk about. They're going to get the idea. And so, but then, so that was, like, that was like the big fight with his mom. And so I bought him some Cars socks. And I'm like, look, you can't wear Cars gear to church, but you can still wear the socks so you can still represent. And so he's like, all right, that's cool. That's cool. And so, but he went through a period of time where he would only eat Cars food. And, uh, you know, when the movies are big, they do all these licensing agreements. So he was eating, uh, like, Kraft macaroni and cheese, which he's a big mac and cheese fan. As I, I think all kids are born with that in their DNA. Um, but it was, like, in the shape of the Cars characters. So that's what he was eating. And then he was eating um, Cars Cheez-Its because the Cheez-Its had the Cars stamp on them. And so he was rocking the Cheez-Its. And then there was cereal, and whatever cereal, it did not matter what cereal, what type it was. If it had a Cars character on it, that's the one he wants to eat. And so we were uh, walking one day in, in Publix, him and I, and he saw Cars yogurt. And he's like, Dad, I love yogurt. I'm like, for real? Yes, I love yogurt. I need this Cars yogurt. It was Cars yogurt. It had like the guys on the front, but it was pear-flavored yogurt. Now, we all know pears are disgusting just in and of themselves. It's like they're, they're, they shouldn't even qualify as like the cousin of an apple. It's like, I wonder if apples get together like, look at the pear. So weird, man. So nasty. Anyway, that's what I think. But, and so, but he's, so we get home and he's like, Dad, I want that yogurt. So he opens it up. It's got like Lightning McQueen or Mater on the front. I can't remember which. And he's, so he takes his first bite and he's like, hmm, mm, mm, yeah, yeah. How is it, Zan? <coughs> it's good. Real good. He ate the whole thing. I mean, he, re he really did. I mean, he was militant. And, and uh, sometimes we'll go out. If we go out to a restaurant, he'll say, Dad, can I borrow your phone? I'm like, what, you need to make a call? You know, who do you call? You, the, only, the only people you know are your parents. And so uh, he'll say, no, 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 I, need to wa I want to watch YouTube. And I'm like, oh, so you want to watch cars? I'm like, no, no, no. I, he, watch, he would watch product reviews of the new car's toys that were coming out. And then when he had gone through all of those, uh, and, and th then he started watching videos, he would find these videos of kids playing with their car's toys. So it's like, if I can't play, you know, well, Dad, I, I don't have my car's toys here, but then I watch a video of this kid, he does a pretty good job. <laughs> playing with his, like, he just, yeah, he just kind of like shoots him across the room. Yeah, that's what he does, pretty good. This kid's not bad. So anyway, so on his last birthday, when he turned four, he got these, uh, he got this car's track, which... I mean, I'm too old for such things and too mature, but the, the track was pretty awesome. Now, here's the thing that was cool about the track is that the track was in like a figure eight, if you can imagine, and then you had to wind it up. And once you would wind that thing up, you would put the car in, and that thing would start shooting in a figure eight motion. And then it had this other thing that after it went around a couple times, it, a ramp came up. It would go off the ramp, and it would like blow through a billboard, and then it would, you know, shoot out into the rest of the room. It was pretty awesome. And so... I showed, you know, I did it a few times, showed Xander how to do it. This is how you wind it up. Okay, awesome. So this is, he's opening his stuff. This is after his party's over and all that. And so now, just so you know, like my kids uh, go to sleep at like, they go to bed pretty early. So my kids go to sleep between like 7.30 and 8 o'clock. Xander is on the early side of that. And it does not matter where we are. 
7.30 hits, he's like, hey, I'm out. You know, and, and uh, I mean, we could be in the mall. One time we were walking in the mall, dad, pick me up. Why? Because I want to go to sleep. It's, oh, it's 7.30. I mean, it's like the kid does not know how to tell time. His body tells him 7.30, he's out of juice. And uh, so he's, he's ready to sleep. Well, anyway, so he gets tired from winding. Because it's, it's, it's like now I, I'm letting him go for a while. And Carrie says, hey, can you get the kids ready? Yeah, no problem. So it, the, the thing's winding up. It's almost 9 o'clock. And he's been winding this thing for a couple hours. And then he gets so tired. It's almost 9. He's wasted. He's so, so uh, sleepy. And he's like laying on the floor trying. He can't do it. And he's like, Mia, Mia. My daughter comes over because she's more like the night owl, you know. And uh, Mia comes over. What's up, Xander? Help me wind this. Sure. He wa- she winds it one time and then realizes, hey, I've got a fresh arm out of the bullpen. And uh, so, and then he's laying down. He's like, wind it again. So she winds it again. He's like, wind it again. And so he's like, he's laying on the floor like his face in the carpet. He's half asleep and he just keeps telling her to wind it. Well, now it's like 930. And you're wondering like, why haven't I put these kids sleep it? Because this is just an interesting sociological experiment. Um, so I'm probably going to have to apologize with a the therapist to all these kids later. But anyway, so they're wi- me is winding it up and now she's tired. So she's laying down trying to wind it up. Xander falls asleep and there, she's still winding it. And then she falls asleep. She starts sawing logs. Xander wakes up because he doesn't hear the zzzz of the winding. And then he starts like, wake up! Wind it again! You know, and I'm like, dude, we're calling it. This is, ta- you know, we're tapping out. You know, we're going to do this again tomorrow. And, and now here's the thing that happens, right? I think we have this same kind of idea when it comes with God. You see, we want God to do a work in our lives, a work we can't do for ourselves, And when God doesn't come through in our timetable that we've set up, we think that he's asleep at the wheel. And so, and and then when we say, well, I gave God this amount of time, he didn't do it, he must be asleep, and so now it's up to me to make it happen because I've got to figure out how to do this on my own. See, such is the case in the life of the man that we're going to look at today. This is a guy who has a need in his life. And if you're here and you've got a need in your life, listen, you're in good company. This guy has a big need in his life. But what hap- he wants God to heal him. This guy has been living with some kind of infirmity. We're not told what it is. Um, uh, but he's got some kind of infirmity. And God is not delivered within his allotted time frame. And so he has spent 38 long years chasing myths and legends and oh maybe this could work and that could work wasting the time that God has given to him now as we're going to talk about this idea and Jesus is going to show up in an amazing way and heal this guy uh, this guy who's been lame uh, for 38 years and 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 all that and so uh, if if we're going to talk about that I thought that if we're going to talk about the subject of healing I think it's an important thing for us to kind of lay some of the groundwork in that because um, you know all of us are coming in and maybe we're from different perspectives and you know there's some folks here like healing that seems weird I don't know if God really is into that stuff and then there's uh, the other spectrum which is of course God heals he has to heal no matter what God has to do that and so I I thought that I would share a little bit of perspective on this uh, to kind of give us a foundation and then springboard into our text in John chapter 5 which is where we're going to be and so you know there's kind of the whole spectrum sometimes there's people that say well you're not healed because you don't have enough faith there's others people say well God doesn't do that anymore Uh, well what does the Bible say The thing that I love is that the Bible says this. uh, It's in your notes in Hebrews 13 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love that. You know what it tells me? Because Jesus healed people throughout his ministry. He healed them spiritually, emotionally, and even physically. And Jesus' disciples did the same thing. And I believe it continues to this day when it's God's will to do it. He will work the miraculous and heal supernaturally when he desires to do it. And so uh, God heals, God revealed himself to the people of Israel. God revealed himself in the Old Testament that his name was Yahweh. But then he he would attach these, um, the kind of a secondary name, a second Hebrew word that would kind of explain that a little more. So he would say, I am, you know, Yahweh. But then he would say, uh, in in this case, in the book of Exodus, he says, I am Yahweh Rapha. Rapha is a a Hebrew word, means healer. And so he's saying, I am the God of who heals you. In, in Exodus 15, if you read it, it's in your notes. And it says, he said, and if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obey his commands 
and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And man, there is a lot of confusion on this subject. And so, I mean, if we had about three hours, I think I have about enough material for three hours on this subject, but they don't give me that long to talk. Um, and so what I want to do instead is I, I, I want to talk about three things, three realities about healing that we can talk about and give us kind of a springboard into our text. So here's the first one if you're, if you're taking notes, right? Three truths about physical healing. Number one, you can't force or predict healing. You can't. You can't force it. You can't predict it. Um, Jesus didn't heal every person. In fact, the story that we're going to read in John chapter 5 is about a guy uh, who has been sick for 38 years, and he's at this pool called Bethesda, which is where all the sick people hung out. What we read is that Jesus comes, heals the one guy, and then leaves. He didn't heal every person at the pool that day. He healed the one guy. And so why? I, we don't, we're not told. There were many sick people there, but this is the guy who Jesus wanted to heal at that moment. So you can't force or predict it. The second thing that I'd say is this, is that doctors are not the enemy of God. They're not the enemy of faith. God uses doctors to heal people. And there are in some Christian circles, we put you know, God on one side and we put medicine on the other, and then we say, well, you've got to decide who you have faith in. Um, and, and, and then we draw some conclusion that using medicine somehow isn't godly or anything like that. Um, can, can I just tell you this? In the story of the Good Samaritan, some of you know that story, right? It's a fam one of the most famous stories Jesus told. Um, Jesus commends this Samaritan man who finds this Jewish man who has, been, who has fallen among robbers. And listen to what it says. I put it in your notes. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. Listen, pouring oil on a wound was a common medicinal practice in that day, in the ancient world. He put in bandages to stop the bleeding. Uh, listen, we need to realize that medical advancement is a gift from God, not the enemy of faith. And we've got to stop pitting uh, science and medicine with God. Listen, um, God is the one who's, God uses this uh, when, when it's his will to, 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 to heal people uh, through medicine, through doctors. Third thing I would say is this, not being healed doesn't mean that you've sinned. It doesn't mean that you've sinned. In fact, let me read you this passage, because that was, in, in uh, the time of Jesus, that was a very common uh, type of thinking that people had. Listen to what it says. It says, as, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his own sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. You see, a person not being healed doesn't mean they've sinned. It doesn't mean God doesn't love them. It simply means God has chosen not to heal them at that, at that particular point in time. We don't need to read anything more into it than that. And God may want to do another work through them. God may want to reveal himself through that weakness. But it doesn't mean that that person has sinned. It also doesn't mean that that person lacks faith. You can have all the faith in the world and still not be healed. And that's one of the arguments that people have in, in Christian circles. Is, well, you're not healed because you don't have enough faith. Well, guess what? You know, the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote half of the New Testament, I think we can safely say that that dude had a lot of faith. And uh, he, he, he had an infirmity that he wasn't healed of. In fact, I put it in your notes. I, I put it in the message translation, which sometimes is hit or miss. But I thought this was a really, um, I thought that it, it translated this really well. He said this, because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant, con constant touch with my limitation. Satan's angel did his best to get me down, but what it, he did, in fact, was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first I didn't think of this as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that and then he told me my grace is enough. All, it's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. You see that years ago there was this, these preachers that were out and their whole thing 
was, if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. Everybody should be healed all the time if you only have enough faith. You know what the problem is with one of those guys? They died. And I wonder, like, why is that? If you had enough faith, you'd still be alive, right? I mean, that, that, if, if, if you're going by the same kind of thinking. But the problem is, that's not the way it works. Um, and, and because that happens to everyone. Because last I checked, the stats on death are still hovering right around 100%. And so listen, and here's the thing we have to understand. Physical healing is temporary at best. Think about this. I mean, people say, man, it wouldn't have been cool to have been Lazarus. You know, like you were dead, and then Jesus brings you back, and he's like the most popular guy in town afterward. Like, you, you really think that'd be fun? You die, you know, you go through all that ordeal. You know, it's like Woody Allen says, I don't fear death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Um, and so... He dies. He goes to heaven. It says that he had been dead four days before Jesus raised. So he's been in heaven for four days. And then God's like, hey, um, interesting thing. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, just, just take your, your ticket, and we're going to send you back for a while. Like, no, don't do that. Like, I'm telling you, man, if, if I die and someone prays for me to come back, I'm hitting the first person I see when I come back. It's like, <laughs> That was from Jesus. You know, well, maybe not, but I'm going to tell him that. Uh, like, dude, don't pray for me to come back. When I'm there, uh, you know, that's it. This is a one-way stop. And so, and, and that's the thing, right, is that because the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 9, it says that it is appointed unto man once to die. It's a natural part of life. And so if you can't force or predict healing, what can you do? You see, I want to show you three things. When you've got a real need in your life, when this guy right here, he had a big need in his life, what can he do? I want to show you how Jesus collides with him and how we have this opportunity to have a real kind of, uh, a real collision with God. And he can just totally uh, minister to us, change our perspective, and maybe even do the very thing that we're praying for him to do. Uh, it's in John chapter 5 is the story we're going to read. And um, we're going to start in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of sick, blind, uh, of sick people, uh, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and whoever stepped in first, all after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him laying there and already knew he had been there for a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now, if you pause there and, and give me your attention, here's the first thing that, that we're going to talk about. Um, if you say, well, I've got a need. I, I've got a problem in my life. What, what, what should I do? Here's the first thing. Number one is I need to depend on God. I need to depend on God. Now let me explain what was happening. Uh, I, I've had the privilege of being at the Pool of Bethesda and actually preaching from John chapter 5 at the Pool of Bethesda, which was a thrill uh, for me. But uh, Bethesda is a Hebrew word that means house of mercy. And it was literally a stone's throw from the Temple Mount. One of the things I was so amazed by when I went to Israel is how close things were uh, to, to each other. And so if you come out from the Temple Mount, kind of the north side of the temple, you're going to go down a flight of stairs. You're going, to hang a, you're going to hang a left, and you're going to make your first right, and you're right there. I mean, the Pool of Bethesda is a very, it's a stone's throw from the Temple Mount. Now, there was this tradition that an angel would stir up the water, and whoever got into the water first was healed. Now, the reality is this pool was part of an underground um, uh, spring of water, and on occasion, there was an eruption from the spring, which is what caused uh, the stirring of the water and what John records is hey this is what people were there uh, at this at, at the water's edge of, of this pool because this is what they believed that there was an angel who was stirring the water this man had spent the last 38 years of his life waiting to be the first guy in the pool and he wasn't the first guy in the pool every single time and you I want you to think about something uh, I want you to think about how committed you've been to certain things but, but to be committed to something for 38 years. I mean, imagine today, you'd say, I've been committed to this for 38 years. I've been at the water's edge waiting 
for, for, for something to happen. And, well, I mean, think about that. That would have meant that you had started your journey of 38 years. It would have started in 1976. And you're still waiting. I mean, think about what life was like in 1976. Star Wars hadn't even come out in 1976. I mean, we were living like animals back then. You know, Gerald Ford was president. I don't know how stellar that presidency was. Um, and, and so, I mean, this was a, and, and think about that. Now, he's hanging out there, but you know what the weird thing is? Because the temple is so close, it's like, why is he hanging out at the pool rather than going to the temple and actually learning of God? Now, here's what what I think happens many times, is that when God doesn't deliver on our schedule and our time frame, we start to take matters into our own hands. You see, if this man would have decided, I'm going to go to the temple and spend my life and spend my time seeking God, learning God's word, having people pray for me, uh, watching God develop me in my life, and maybe God would, would do the healing work in me as well. But instead, he decides to go to the pool. Because there's something interesting that happens at the pool. At the pool, I'm in charge. I don't have to listen to anybody else. I don't have to uh, change my life in any way that I'm hearing what God's word has to say about me. Instead, here's what I can do. I can just sit by the pool and try to be first. Because if I want to be healed, all I have to do is be first. You see, hanging out by the pool is all about control. I don't know if you've n- noticed this in your life. I've certainly noticed it in my life. Have you ever found that most of the bad decisions that we make in our life are a result of a lack of patience? It really is. In my life, when I look back, most of the bad choices that I've made have come because I have not waited on God. And impatience has this way of killing the good that God wants to do in our lives. The Bible would say it this way um, in Pro- uh, Proverbs 19. A man's wisdom gives him patience, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Think about that. A man's wisdom gives him patience. The wiser you become, the more patient you'll become. I I remember back when I I used to run a college. Some of you know that or not. I used to run a college before coming and starting Calvary. And uh, we shared the, the property that we were meeting in. At one time, we shared the space with another company. Um, They were on their way out as the people that used to own the facility. And uh, they had sold the facility to the church, and then they were kind of renting it back before they left. And so they had this, we all walked into this area, and there was this big reception area, even though there was no receptionist. But there was this uh, awesome chair that they had. as this leather chair, you know, like an executive type of chair. And I was sitting on this chair. I was 23 years old when I took over this college. and, And I was like developing back problems because this chair was crooked and it was all messed up and um, anyway so I talked to the guy that oversaw the facility I'm like hey man um, nobody sits at all these months I've noticed nobody sits at the reception desk what do you think about just giving me that that executive chair so that I can use it because this other chair I have is horrible and he said yeah I don't think that's a problem let me just go ahead and ask somebody and I'll uh, I'll let you know so I said okay and then um, you know a couple weeks go by Month goes by, six weeks go by, two months go by, and I'm like, man, this guy has forgotten about me. So one day I get so mad that I go to Office Depot during lunch, I buy a chair, I strap that thing to the roof of my car, um, and I get it back to the office. I push the thing, because, you know, it's like, and the chair's in a million pieces. I push the thing back to the area, you know, where my office is at the college, finally get it there, I open up the door to my office, and the leather chair is behind my desk. And I was like, oh no. And then I've got this humongous box, and I'm like, what do I do with this box? And I'm like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build the box and just put it in somebody else's desk. I put it in somebody else's office, and no one will be the wiser. So I'm, I start building it, and then I'm, you know, you gotta, I'm, get, I'm on the floor, and I'm under the, de- under the chair, and I'm trying to, you know, they give all those little tools that don't really work, and I'm trying to get the desk, the, the chair built so I can put it in somebody else's desk. And then the guy walks in, and he's like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, me? What am I doing? You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, you know, I I don't know. And uh, I don't know why I started talking like that. And uh, and, and I'm like, well, you know, and he's like, what's that chair? And I'm like, oh, chair. 
I have a chair. I'm a chair hobbyist, and I don't even know if hobbyist is a word. And uh, but I have a hobby that I build chairs for the needy, and uh, and so so I'm trying to make something up. And he and he says, um, "You bought the chair, didn't you?" And I'm like, "Yes." I was so like I, I felt so bad. I'm like, "I did." And he's like, "I told you to trust me. I told you it was going to take a little while, but I was going to get you this really awesome chair." I mean, it's like chair was like a thousand dollar chair and and he's like and i got i got you this really nice chair and and you 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 and you decided to go after like a fifty dollar chair that you that you bought um and 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 i'm telling you i was so i felt so guilty that true story i felt so guilty i couldn't even sit in the chair i actually gave the chair to my assistant and i'm like you take the chair i can never look at it which means i can never walk into your office ever again if we ever need to speak you have to come out um, and true story, like, I, I gave her the chair. I never looked at it again, and, uh, and I used the $50 chair that I bought. But one of the, listen, one of the signs that we are growing in our walk with God is that we are willing to wait on him. I love this passage in Isaiah that says it this way. It says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So Jesus walks up to this guy who's been laying there for 38 years. And he says to him in a way that only Jesus can do. And he says, hey, do you want to be made well? And I think we look at that and we're like, of course he wants to be made well. That's why he's hanging out by the water. But can I tell you this, that not everybody wants to be made well. Not everybody that has a problem wants the problem to be fixed. Some people want to sit, sulk, and sour over how life has not gone their way. And can I tell you something, that instead of living like that, we can actually live a different way. We can start believing again that God wants to work things out on our behalf. We can start depending on Him again. We need to ask ourselves, do we want to be made well or do we just want to live and have something to complain about? You see, the Bible promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. So listen, so we keep believing, so we keep trusting, so we keep depending on God to come through. Because listen, here's what I love about the story. At just the right moment, Jesus can do in this man's life in one moment what 38 years of human effort was incapable of accomplishing. And the same thing is true in your life. You've been pushing and pressing and hoping and wanting and trying to do it your own way. And here's what happens. One moment of trusting God and one moment of God working in your life can do more than an entire lifetime of human effort that is not aligned with God's will. So what happens? Look at verse 7. The story continues. It says, the sick, Jesus asked, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, I, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool where the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, and he took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Now if you pause there and give me your attention. Uh, the second thing, once again, you have a need in your life, you want God to work in your life. The first thing is that we need to depend on God. The second thing is, is that we need to believe God's word. We need to believe God's word. What I love about this story is that Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And the man's answer is, I don't have anybody. Of course I want to be made well, but I don't have anybody to help me into the pool. And, and, and I think, man, that's sometimes so much like us, where we start to believe that the only thing that we can do, the only thing that God can do is what we have actually imagined in our own minds. And what if what God wants to do is even greater than the work that we have imagined in our minds? And listen, too often times we limit what we think God can do because we can only think of God working within the realm of our own understanding. Listen, God, our God, works best outside of the realm of our own understanding. That's why if you've been coming to Calvary in any length of time, you've heard this verse hundreds of times, uh, because I talk about it just about every week. But it's my life verse. That's why I, I love talking about it. Uh, it's in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. But I, 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 just, I put it in there so you can, you can see it, not just hear it. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Think about that. I, I just, 
I, I have been a Christian now for, um, at the end of this month, will be 21 years that I've given my life to Jesus Christ. And I still can't get over this verse. I remember reading for the first time that it's like, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. That God is, is operating in a different realm than what we can even imagine. And listen, I ta- every time someone gives their life to Jesus, I tell them this. Whatever dream you have for your life, it doesn't even scratch the bottom of what God wants to do. And, and, and listen, because sometimes we kind of create this template. And we say, no, this is the only way that God can really work. And so many times that we're, we're missing out on what God really wants to do. Because we, we put all these limits on what we think God can do. And he's like, hey, well, what about do you want to be made well? Well, I need somebody to push me in the pool. Well, who are you talking to, man? You're talking to Jesus, the guy that just has to say a word and you can be made well. And you're looking for like a lifeguard in reverse. Like most lifeguards are taking people out. You're like, I just need somebody to push me in and then I'll, I'll be better. And, and listen, let me tell you how it works. I, I shared a little bit of this on Good Friday a couple weeks ago. Um, but we get our kids Easter baskets on Easter. I, most parents do that for their kids. And, uh, but it's besides like candy and a few other things, we usually get them like one nice gift. Um, and, and so my son Xander has been asking for this, um, this Lego set. He loves these little ninja Lego dudes. And uh, so he's been asking for it. It's really hard to find. And he's like, Dad, I'd really like to get this on Easter. Were you going to get it for me? I said, I don't know, buddy. You're going to have to find out. Uh, you'll find out on Easter. And he's like, well, but the thing about my son is that he likes to hedge his bets a little bit. And so he goes, well, Dad, I just want to show you which one. And one of the things that he got uh, for Christmas was this Lego encyclopedia. It's like his new New Testament. Uh, it's like he's like the Bible that's like the third testament to him because he like references chapter and verse in this Lego book and he's like well dad let me just show you so you really have an understanding of what I'm looking for but Xander has this idea because he always says you know he'll say to me like dad you can get this for me and I'll say well you'll see how time he goes I know you you're gonna do it and I don't know if that's like he's using reverse psychology on me like (laughs) Well, I wasn't, but now that you have that expectation, maybe I will, you know? So he says to me, well, you know, are you going to do it? And, and I say, well, you'll find out. And he says, well, Dad, let me just show you. This is the one that I really want. Now, you've got to understand, my son is four, but he talks like he's 24. So he'll say, Dad, this is the one that I really want. But any of these other three will be acceptable. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just in case, you know, because I know sometimes they're hard to find. But any of these other three will be acceptable, but this is probably the one that I, that I really want. And so, anyway, what he doesn't know, what he didn't know at the time, was that I had found this guy on eBay whose son had played with these. At least that's what he said. Who knows? It could have been him. Uh, but but the, the best part is they were already built. And some people are like, oh, no, it's not as fun. Listen, I'm saving hours of time because they're already built. And I was like, hey, guess what? Here you go. They're out of the bag, already built. Go have fun. I'm going to lay down. You know what I mean? So that's, that's kind of the thing. So I give him... Um, so, so anyway, so I find, and that, but see, but people like, oh, it's already built, so, and it's already out of the package, so it's not really worth that much, even though for me it was actually worth a little more. So nonetheless, I, um, I bid on it, and I win it, and I actually win. Uh, the guy's not just selling one. He's selling five sets. But the five sets, are, I got it for cheaper than I would have paid it for one set at, like, Toys R Us or something. So I feel like I'm winning big time. So uh, Easter comes around. And Xander thinks he's getting one set. And he opens up the box. And the box has five sets in it. And they're already built. And my son, who's like very verbose, you know, he's, he, I don't know where he gets it from, but, uh, you know, he's like very articulate for a four-year-old. He's like, I'm seriously, that's, he sounds like, you know, it's like he's like Darth Vader's choking him. You know, he's having one of these moments. And he's like, I, I, I can't, I can't believe it. I just totally blew his mind. He stopped learning, knowing how to speak English. Uh, his mind was so blown at that. And listen, here's the point. What if God wants to do a greater work in your life than anything you could ask, think, or imagine? What if the work that God wants to do in you is so over the top based on anything that you could have possibly thought of or concocted in your mind? I'm telling you, when things are difficult, it's, it's one of those moments where we, we kind of see where our faith is. Some of you know this, some of you don't. Um, about three years ago, my oldest daughter, Mia, who's seven, she got sick. And uh, Mia was diagnosed with an illness called Steven Johnson syndrome that has a 5% survival rate. And um, this is a horrible 
uh, illness and her whole body started um, swelling. Her face swelled up to two or three times the size. Her feet swelled up to where she couldn't walk. Uh, her hands swelled up. I mean, she couldn't even hold a crayon to, to color. And so she, we, and I remember I'm sitting in Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital uh, with her, and we had already been there for a couple of days. And, and, and um, she had asked for her mom to lay with her so that she could go to sleep. And because uh, she was in so much pain. And so um, they were giving her some things that they could give her to make her comfortable. And they're like, that's all we can do is make her comfortable that, that, as much as we can. And then they told us because she had kept swelling up, um, they, they said, listen, everything, you know, all of her extremities are swelling up. And the thing that we're nervous about is that her esophagus is going to start swelling up. And so if she doesn't start getting better, um, you know, or something happened, if she begins to swell up, uh, we're going to have to intubate her. Um, so that she's going to be able to breathe and take in fluids and all that kind of stuff. And, and I mean, you know, I, I, I am like totally beside myself as to what, it, what can, can happen, you know. And I'm watching this three-year-old little girl, and, and I mean, I'm just bargaining with God, and, and I'm begging God to do anything, and I'm asking God, listen, I, I, I'll make you a trade, and I will trade my life for hers, willingly and gladly. You just take God, give, everything you're giving her, just give it to me. I'll take it. And if you want to just strike me right here, then, then let's do it. And, 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 I was, and I'm making God this offer as, as, if I'm, as if I'm bargaining with like a trader at a flea market or something. And I, and I'm, and, and I remember calling out to God. And I remember God, man, and this was not like an audible voice, but uh, one of the times in my life that I know that God was speaking to me. Um, I was sitting in that chair, and Carrie and Mia had fallen asleep. Mia had finally fallen asleep. Uh, and God spoke to me, and he says, I understand what it is to watch your child suffer. And, and, and I'm crying and crying and crying, and, and I, I'm just listening. He says, I remember when my son was crucified. That hurts. I remember. I know what it is to watch your child suffer. And I had this, I had this moment with God. And, and after all of that, I, I just said, and I stopped the bargaining. And I said, God, she's yours. She's always been yours. And if you decide that you're going to take her, then I will count these three years as the best three years of my life. Um, but no matter what, I'm going to follow you. And then um, I, I, I was praying and praying and we, I finally fell asleep for a little while. I woke up the next morning and um, you know, we woke up Carrie woke up, then Mia woke up and um, you know Mia started feeling a little bit better the swelling in her feet started to go down just a few, uh, you know, I mean we were talking about like intubating her um, by noon the next day she was walking a little bit and we had gone to like this play area and, and so um, her hands started to stop swelling so much and she was able uh, to sit on this little like uh, horse rocking thing and so she was playing with that a little bit and then um, then the first thing she had, she had totally lost her appetite but we had played a little bit and then she said dad I'd really like to eat something and I'm like what would you like and you want you want you know um, and they said well you probably shouldn't give her anything too much you know maybe like a yogurt or a shake and I'm like and she says oh I'd really like a milkshake and, um, and there was a McDonald's downstairs, which, by the way, I think is a weird thing to put in a hospital. Um, it's almost like they're looking for repeat business. Um, but anyway, so, um, so, I said, <laughs> so I said, okay, so I went down there. I've never been so happy to spend three bucks at McDonald's uh, to buy my daughter a, uh, a, 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 a vanilla milkshake. And she drank the vanilla milkshake. And, um, then that, and she just kept getting better. Listen, the following day, we went home. Today, my daughter is seven and a half years old, and she is 100% healthy and whole. Yeah. And you know, I think, I look back on my, on my moment of bargaining with God, and I realize that I'm the man at the pool. I'm the man at the pool. God, if you can just find somebody to push me in. No, that's, see, what if the work that God wants to do is greater than anything you could imagine? What if we start bargaining and, and, real, and, and we just sometimes forget? Listen, in that moment, those first couple days, I forgot something about God. I forgot that he loved that little girl more than I did. 
And I didn't think that was possible, but I, I, I realized that it's true, that God, listen, God, that God loves you. And he loves you with a father's heart. And his desire for you and his plan for you is greater than anything you could ever even want for yourself. So that's why we gotta, we got to keep believing. we got to keep remembering the promises that have been given to us. There's over 2,000 promises in the Bible, and guess what? They are for you. So we've got to hold on to them. We've got to believe them. We've got to repeat them. We've got to keep uh, telling them to ourselves. That's why the Bible says this in your notes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. This man believed the word when Jesus spoke to him. He says, hey, I need somebody to push me in. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the man stood up. And look what happens next. This is the last, the last part. And verse 10 says, Therefore the Jews said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, He who made me well said, Take up your bed and walk. And they said to him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was ill did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn in a multitude being in that place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, not only because he broke the Sabbath, but also he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. If you pause there and give me your attention, here's the last thing I want to tell you. You have a need in your life, then here's what we need to do. We need to rest in God's work. We need to rest in God's work. Here's where the problem begins. Jesus did, does a great work by healing this man, and he does it on the Sabbath. But the religious leaders see healing on the Sabbath as a violation of the Sabbath, and certainly carrying your bed on the Sabbath. So they can't even rejoice that this man who's been ill, carrying a huge burden in his life for 38 years, they, they can't even rejoice in the fact that he's been made well and that's been lifted all they could see is that that was a violation uh, of the Sabbath, they would say. Now, here's what Jesus' answer would be. In Luke chapter 14, in another situation when Jesus heals a guy, here's what Jesus says. It says, He answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or ox that falls into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Now, here's the point. Jesus is saying, uh, well, the Bible actually gives... Um, exceptions to the Jewish people when it's okay to work on the Sabbath if it's an extenuating circumstance. The point Jesus is making is, is that if you have an animal that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, aren't you actually going to help him out to alleviate the suffering of that animal? Of course you are. And if that is true, why would you actually make a big deal about God healing a man on the Sabbath and, and in doing the same thing, alleviating suffering? Here's the point, and that's why I love the play on words that Jesus gives when he says, listen, up until now, my father has been working, and I have been working. You see, in that culture, you didn't talk about working on the Sabbath, and Jesus says this other, this thing that's so amazing. He says, not only have I been working, but God has been at work even on the Sabbath. And that's, what they, they're just, they're totally blown away. And here's the thing that we need to understand about that too, that God cares for you. And that, listen, we can rest in the fact that God is working for our good. Can I tell you this? That God is not asleep at the wheel. God is not taking a day off in your life. Instead, God is hard at work in your life. He hasn't forgotten about you. God is at work even when you can't see it. And I think this is the hardest part. When we say, man, I want God to be at work, but I, mean, but I don't see the results. I don't, I don't see the process. Here's what we need to remember. As long as you're still here, it's not over. As long as you're still breathing, God is working. As long as you're still in the fight, still venturing out in faith, God is still the God who can move mountains. God is still the God who can raise the dead. Because my friends, God's delays are not God's denials. 
Just because you can't see what God's doing doesn't mean that God isn't working. Faith is about believing what we know to be true even when we can't see it. That's why the Bible would say this, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's this kind of a peculiar story that's told of, of Jesus in the Gospels that Jesus walks up to a fig tree. He sees no fruit on the fig tree. And then he curses the fig tree and says that it's going to wither and die. But you know what the weird thing is? Jesus said it, and then nothing happened. I mean, if you were watching the fig tree, he had made the command, said this fig tree is going to die, and it's going it's to wither up, uh, and nothing happens. The next day, everyone returns, and the fig tree is completely withered. Now, here's the point is that maybe there is a promise that God has given you and it just hasn't come to pass yet. And it doesn't mean that it's not true. It simply means we haven't given it enough time to actually come to pass. Because God is at work in your life. Because God is a loving Father. And He has your best at heart. He loves you. And listen, God is for you. And the Bible says if God is for you, who can be against you? Listen, we need to start believing that again. The Bible would say it this way. This is a, a, a little hidden passage that I love in the book of Hosea. It says this, I will return her vineyards to her and I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. And see, maybe you're in the place where you're in the valley of trouble right now. And you're like, man, I want things to get better and I don't know how it's gonna get better. And maybe God has given you a promise that it's the valley of trouble. But he's going to turn it into the gateway of hope. That very that difficulty that you're going through is the very thing that God's going to use to bring you hope and bring others hope who actually see what's happened in your life through this challenge. My friends, God is still working. God is not asleep at the wheel. We have the promise that he said, up until now, my father's been working, and I have been working, and he's working right now. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you for your love, for your promise that you're never going to leave us or forsake us. You're never going to just tell us to figure it out on our own. Instead, you're a loving father. And God, your plans for us, your hope for us, are plans of peace and not of evil. God, remind us again that we need to keep believing, keep trusting, keep waiting even when it's difficult because you're the one who calls to us and says, do you want to be made well? So Lord, do that work even in these closing moments, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, here's how it works sometimes is that there's a difficulty that brings you here. Something in life, uh, some challenge takes place and um, it just, it's, what, it's what brings us here. And things haven't been going well and you're, kind of, you're growing weary in the race. And you're, you're starting to lose hope and your faith isn't as strong as it has been. And Sometimes a challenging time co comes into our lives and it just causes us to want to walk away. And um, listen, I want you to know something. God hasn't forgotten about you. He loves you. Jesus Christ died for you. That's how much he loves you. And God's dream is to give you a life that's filled with a future and a hope. And listen, I, I know when we talk about knowing God, I, I'm not just talking about knowing, the, oh yeah, there's a God out there, up there, the man upstairs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about really knowing God and walking with him. That God actually wants us to know him. And he wants us to walk with him that he wants to change our life personally. You see, the same offer that Jesus made to this man is the same word that Jesus has for us today. Do you want to be made well? You see, maybe you're here and it's like your relationship has crashed and, you know, it's over and all this is happening and, and there's some anger that's residing and he says, do you want to be made well? Maybe this has gone on for a long time and there's some bitterness that's starting to take root in your heart and here's what he's calling out to you. Do you want to be made well? 
You see, life hasn't turned out the way that it was supposed to. And so now there, there's, there's some anger that's, that's starting to bubble up to the top. And he's saying, do you want to be made well? All these things, he's, he's, he's calling out to us. And he's saying, do you want to be made well? And sometimes we sit by the pool because that's the place where we can talk about how life didn't go our way. And man, I prayed, but nothing happened. Man, I, I called on God. I mean, look, I've been, look how long I've been at the pool. But nothing's happening. And all along, there's the voice that's saying, do you want to be made well? That's the work that God wants to do in your life, in my life today. He wants us to know him and to walk with him. So I'm going to invite all of us to stand in these closing moments together. Because here's what I know is that some, for some of us, it's a real question that God is asking to us, today, do we want to be made well? Today, do we want God to work in us and through us? Today, do we want to let go of all the hate and anger and bitterness and frustration and all the things that have kept us by the pool? the pool of our own control, the pool of our own creation, the pool of all the stuff that it's like, no, see, if I go there, I'm going to be forced to change. But here I can control it. Here I can just do what I want. Listen, maybe today's the day to let go of that. Maybe today's the day to say, I'm not going to spend my whole life living at the pool when I can actually heed the words who said, do you want to be made well? And I can start walking with him and see this healing and wholeness that he wants to bring in my life. Listen, some of you have come in, and listen, emotionally, you're beat up. And he's calling to you and saying, do you want to be made well? Some of us physically, some of us spiritually, some of us, it's just through the course of our lives. Mentally, it's like, man, I'm just wiped out. I've tried everything. And I'm still at the pool. Then maybe the last thing to do is actually to walk away from the pool the pool of our own control, the pool of our own creation, and say, God, now I'm going to follow you because I want to be made well. I want you to change my life from the inside out. And that's what we're going to do. And if you're here and you say, that's what I want, then we've got to actually respond to the one who's calling to us. Jesus is calling to us, saying, listen, I want to do this work in you. Do you want to be made well? Then listen, take up your mat and walk. Let's do this. So the band is going to sing in a moment, and when they do, if you're here and you say, I want to be made well, I want God to forgive me, I want Him to change my life, then here's what I'm going to invite you to do. When they begin to sing, you take a step forward and meet me here at the base of this platform where I'm going to pray for you, and I want to lead you in a simple prayer. And here's what I know, is that if we will call out to God in sincerity that He will hear, He will answer, and He will act, and he will do the work that only he can do. Because listen, some of us have spent a whole lifetime trying to change. And as we learned in this story, sometimes one moment of God doing a work in our life, can, God can do more than an entire lifetime of us trying to do things on our own. So maybe today is your day where you say, I'm, I'm leaving the pool and I'm going to follow Jesus. I want to be forgiven. I want to be made whole. I want him to do a work in me. So if you're ready, when they start to sing, you meet me here and you watch God do what only he can do in your life. And you're going to mark it on the calendar that this is the day that everything began to change. So if you're ready, let's do it. Meet me here. George, lead us.
God bless you guys. Listen, the Bible says this, today if you will hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Listen, that guy was sitting at the pool and he could have made every excuse in the world as to why it wasn't going to work. But he said, do you want to be made well? Do you want him to change your life? Listen, this is your moment. I'm going to pray with these who have come forward, but I'm going to give you another moment. If you say, I need to be there. I know you need to be here. But God wants to do that work. Yeah, God bless you. Yeah, God bless you guys. We'll wait for you. Yeah. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And and, and here's what I know. Here's how it works. And I... I talk to enough people and we've, we've seen God do this work so many times that a lot of times you're standing in your seat you know by your seat and, and, and you're saying you're feeling something that you never felt before and you're saying I know I need to be there but man I'm a little nervous to take a step and walk up but I know I need to be there and so there's this wrestling that's happening and listen some of you were brought by a friend listen if you attend Calvary can you just tell your friend that uh, you that went with you listen if you want me to, to if you want to go up I'll go up with you Let's go up together and watch God do a work uh, in our lives. Just turn to him right now and ask him that. And sometimes that's just the one step that they need to be able to make that that decision that's going to change their life forever. And um, the other thing is this. The reason you're feeling this, oh, I never felt this before, what is that? Listen, that's God's spirit working in you. And that's why it feels a little different. Oh, man, what is that? And and you're saying, I know I need to do this. And if I can just kind of hold down until I get to my car, I can just kind of work this out and, 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 and walk away. Listen, the man could have stayed at that pool. But Jesus is standing there saying, do you want to be made well? Listen, right now you have this moment that God is calling you, saying, do you want to be made well? And the answer for all of us should be yes. I do want to be made well. Then that means we've got to let go of some of the stuff that we've been holding on to. Some of the stuff that we even say, oh, no, no, but being at the pool is my identity. Being at the pool has just kind of become who I am. We've got to walk away from that. Because God is calling us to change us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to transform our life. So listen, I'm giving you another moment. I'm going to pray with these guys here in just a second. The band's not going to do another chorus. I'm just going to, listen, you are in in the midst of friends. When you take a step, you know what's going to happen? This place is going to explode with applause. You know why? Because most of us have taken the same few steps that you, you need to take. And we know what God has done when we've taken those steps as well. At the end of this month, it's going to be 21 years I've given my life to Jesus Christ. And my only regret in life is that I didn't do it sooner. That's why the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. This is your moment for God to do a work in you and through you. So this is it. Listen, those of you that come forward, I just want to share this verse with you. It's one of my favorites. It says, no, it says, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Listen, God wants to do a work of transforming your life. The Bible says this, that if anyone is in Christ, if someone comes, the person who comes to know Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So the person you used to be, all the the guilt and all the stuff that you're like, man, I hope nobody ever finds out about that. Listen, all that stuff gets erased. That's not who you are. That's who you used to be. The Bible says that you are a new creation in Him. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you, and then I want to lead you in a simple prayer. It's not a magic formula or anything like that, but here's what I know. is that it might be my words, but if you pray them in sincerity, God will hear, answer, and act, and begin to transform your life in a way that only he can do. So church, let's pray together. God, we want to thank you 
for those who have taken a step in your direction. And Lord, I pray that you would hear and answer and act as they take a step, as they call out to you, that God, you would do what only you can do. And so Lord, we thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you're still at work in us and that you'll never leave us and never forsake us. Those of you that have come forward, I'm gonna invite you to repeat this prayer out loud. In fact, all of us are gonna repeat it. Say, Lord God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my God, to be my Savior, to be my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. For I've decided today to follow you, Jesus. From this day, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, God bless you.